All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for the webinar, Residential Real Estate and Rail Trails, an On-the-Ground Reality. My name is Candace Gallagher, and I am the Director of Operations and Webinar Coordinator for American Trails. This is our 157th webinar in the American Trails Advancing Trails webinar series. Uh, this free webinar is being recorded. It uh, includes real-time closed captioning in English and also offers free learning credits. Links for both uh, the closed captioning and the learning credit quiz will be in the chat box if you don't already see them there. And attendees will receive a follow-up email with the recording, uh, the transcript, resources slide with the presenter email, as well as learning credit details within two days following the webinar. And we are saving time for attendee questions at the end of the webinar, and we welcome you to send your questions at any time during the presentation. Um, and you can find that uh, the, via the Q&A icon that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. And I want to thank the webinar partners today that not only include our presenter, um, but also the Bureau of Land Management, the U.S. Forest Service, the Federal Highway Administration, as well as the National Park Service. And I am excited to introduce our webinar presenter for the day. We have Craig Della Pena, who is the associate broker with the Murphy's Realtors uh, Trailside team. So I will now hand control over to Craig to start today's presentation. Well, thank you so much, Candice. This is uh, very much looking forward to being here today. And, and uh, we're going to have fun here. This is. Uh, there we go. So this is the image that you see on the American Trails website about today's event here. And I did send Candace and her team a bunch of photos for this initial glam shot here. And they chose this one, which is, wow, I, I couldn't believe it because it was, this is in Rhode Island. And it's a little bit, a little bit unusual for those of you who don't know that Rhode Island of course is the smallest state in the country, but here, they actually have an inverse travel pattern. And it's mostly because they, they don't connect to any other state like Massachusetts or Connecticut yet, but they will. And there will be, uh, I think there will be changes made eventually. So just had to point that out that is part of uh, Rhode Island. And let me just shrink this here for myself. And okay, so. By the way, if there, since there will be questions, I'll flag them out with this uh, little asterisk here, and that will that will allow us to to have good questions at the end uh, for your CEU credit union credit units. I'll flag them out with asterisks. So we're going to look at trails today through different lens. We're going to look through the historic context lens, the community development lens, the trail neighbor slash a butter lens, and the real estate lens. They all sort of blend together here. But let's start here in the historic context. In both Massachusetts and New York, I'm in Western Massachusetts. In fact, within a 150 mile radius where I'm sitting right now is the densest network of dead steam railroad corridor in North America. And they went to little villages all around here. The railroads came second. The villages were here first in cities. But um, we're going to explain some things around the area here for you. The economic impact report that came out in 2014 for the Erie Canal Trailway was, was so shocking to the government of New York that they, they commanded DOT to build another 400 miles in four years. Now, the Empire State Trail now completed, the total is 750 miles, but they didn't just roll out the, uh, the asphalt or the stone dust. They actually did something very unusual here. They brought in a historic consulting person, uh, Matthew Kierstead with his Milestone Heritage Consulting. And they actually did um, interesting kiosks along the way. And Matthew, I've got a conference setting up in uh, July in central Massachusetts. And Matthew will be one of the speakers at that. If you go to GS2022, stands for Golden Spike, Golden Spike 2022. There you'll see the information about the conference. 
But Matthew has done an astounding job of calling out all the obscure railroad history or history of the locale, like Borden's ice cream, Elsie the cow was in that locale, and, and including the uh, other history that's largely forgotten, now being called out on the trail. This is actually being picked up by the rail fan press all over the United States. And it's very interesting that this is now coming to be. You can see this is the kiosk, Finnish kiosk on the Finnish trail. This is actually um, a rail with trail in this section down near Poughkeepsie, New York. Nawadic Network, that's one of my hats I wear. I'm the executive director of this little 501c3. Um, we do historic call outs on the Nawadic Rail Trail. This came about in the uh, days of the Clinton administration where uh, they, they, they had a little uh, contest around the country. The Nawadic Network won for Massachusetts. All states were encouraged to have a, uh, a millennial trail. The Nawadic Network was the millennial trail winner back 20-ish years ago. But what we do now is do little historic callouts. We're doing, one of my board members is a real fan of discovering old lost mile markers. We've got a very robust Google uh, map of the corridor and all the fun things along the way, putting all the conditions of the mile markers. B in this case meant Boston, 51 miles from this point. And if you'd look at it from the other point of view, the other side, it would say N, um, 53 in that point. This corridor is 104 miles long and one side said N and the other side said B. But we're also gonna develop a QR code marker system. We'll probably have between 100 and 150 QR codes on this corridor. This will be the longest one probably in the United States that has a like a uniform QR code call out. Uh, we'll be working with these various agencies to get good historic details about each section of the corridor. And uh, we're even gonna do some video or audio interviews with uh, people who have a good remembrance of things that happened here years ago. The community development lens is a little bit different than a historic context. We'll go there, the human community develop. Go back to New York, where Parks Trails New York, the advocacy organization there based out of Albany, Whose, whose main project was the Erie Canal Trail. And along the way, and actually throughout the state of New York, they had an ongoing series of training sessions on how to make your, more, your community more bike friendly. And in 2014, they actually commissioned a, a uh, this is the infographic for that report I showed earlier, that showed the, the economic impact of the Erie Canal Way Trail it's, it's very, only 78% complete, $250 million a year, 1.6 million visitors. Oh my God. And that was before the pandemic when things have doubled there. This, as I mentioned earlier, this is where the governor commanded DOT to build another <clears throat> 400 miles in four years. It began, the construction began in 2017 during the pandemic, usage doubled and then it was completed. Just in the last few weeks, the Outside Magazine has named this as the best rail trail in the United States. Now, speaking of awards, Massachusetts was just ranked number one for bike friendly awards here in, uh, for the United States. We ranked number one, it was a, kind of a pleasant surprise to everybody in Massachusetts involved in this, but you notice it says D for traffic laws and practices. That's where we'll have to do some improvement. But we ranked number one this year. We were so surprised and so happy. The new Nawadic network, we've rebranded it slightly to be, this is the, the bridge over the Connecticut River, about a mile from my house here. And this is how it's pronounced, Nawadic. There's your little asterisk there, Nawadic. 1,400 feet long, seven spans, ex Boston and Main Railroad Bridge over the river. This is a millennial trail winner, as I noted before. This is the, uh, we're set up to build out the longest and actually most complicated trail to build in New England. We're about 90% now in public 
protected status of, of the 104 miles, 90% um, of that is in public protected status. As I mentioned, this was done during, during the Clinton administration where all states were to do a millennial trail. Trail. There were two candidates here in Massachusetts, the Nawatic Network won, and then they called me. I used to work for Rails to Trails Conservancy as a organizer and in the policy and sort of like parachuting into the war, so to speak. And they called me and I, they said, well, what are we gonna do? And I said, we gotta build a 501c3. And so that's what they did. The, uh, this trail is notable in that it connects the 17 other trails right now. And in, the other notable fact, when Gal Calvin Coolidge was the governor, uh, he used to ride the train from Northampton here all the way out to Boston every day. And by the way, that's got the asterisks on it too. So there you go. Here's the 17 other trails. These are all hot linked, I, he I believe, on the, uh, the, 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 the web version of this that Candace is going to put up. will have hot links on all these trails. This is very notable. The 17. Nine will be shared use paths. Eight will be walking or hiking trails. There's your asterisk again. At 104 miles is the longest in the Northeast. And at the Western end, I've got now the, the left side here, you see this North-South oriented trail. This is the longest interstate trail in the Northeast. At 84 miles, the newly rebranding New Haven and Northampton Canal Greenway. Up until recently, that had 16 separate names. Imagine that. That's the way we do things in New England. We don't look across the borders of our communities too easily or too often. But here we have a unifying trail name and we can brand it now with this unifying name. The other interesting thing is there will be scheduled passenger rail service along all three points. There won't be the east-west between Boston and Northampton directly, but there will be between Springfield and Boston, which is short distance from Northampton. But this is uh, tourism agencies can coordinate a return like they do in the petite train in petite train de Nord outside of Montreal. There's a similar well-marketed thing. As I mentioned earlier, what's the notable thing about the network here? That's where I am right now. Northampton, or actually the village of Florence in Northampton. This is the densest network of former steam railroad corridor in the United States. Here's the high water mark of construction in 1918. Once again, with asterisks on there, remember that date, because this is a high water mark of the New Haven Railroad. Uh, they showed themselves in bold lines and the enemy, or not so much enemy, but the com competitor railroads as sort of lesser lines here, more faint lines. But this is what's been abandoned since 1918. This is what's currently open though. This is about five years out of date. And um, this is what the build out will look like. And there's another 25 to 30% that doesn't even show on here. These are only steam railroad corridors, excuse me. Turn that off. These are just uh, steam railroad corridors. If you add in the electric trolley lines, those would be uh, much, much more effectively doubling the mileage here. These are steam railroad corridors and they didn't go nowhere. They actually went to villages and cities and towns and had huge mill complexes. Most of these mills are closed today. They've been, but they're being repurposed as uh, apartments, condos, uh, startup businesses, and of course, the old forgotten railroad right of way that led to them is becoming trails. As I said, this goes right past where people live, work, play, and kids go to school. Imagine that. And what is the red arrow on there? Well, that would be where I live. I live next to eight feet from one of the oldest municipally built rail trails in southern New England. So I just don't, just don't talk the talk. I actually walk the walk. And we're gonna talk about this corridor in this box, this Mass Central Rail Trail. And there's over a hundred projects underway right now in Massachusetts. 
Most are so short and fragmented, and there's a typo there, I'm sorry, but they don't make it onto the radar screen of the governor, except this one. This is the most significant one because of connections to everywhere else. And, and this is uh, very interesting. All the easy build projects are mostly done in two years, we'll be at 70 miles open. And that 70 miles was the, is the low hanging fruit, the easy to build sections. DOT did a study during the pandemic because they knew there's, there's forward thinking people there today. And they know that this thing uh, is gonna be a problem to build out. There's at least five bridges that are missing that are significant bridges. There's a thousand foot tunnel. Um, so they did this three volume report in 2020 and it shows that it can be done. It can be reassembled. And it's a very detailed analysis of every section of this corridor for a hundred miles. And they know it can be built. This, this, bro, uh, this logo was first proposed uh, by a group called Wachusa Greenways operating in the middle of Massachusetts. And they purposefully did not go down the road for transportation delivery. They went the environmental side funding through the Rec Trail program in Massachusetts, smaller pots of money, easier to build, uh, volunteer component would be very positive. And so that's what happened here, the volunteer component in, uh, in the Wachusa Greenways got this section built. But we adapted that logo to for our Golden Spike conferences. We've hold this one coming up this year uh, will be our eighth conference. And once again, the asterisks are there. And the eighth, this is the location. This is a, the Gilbertville. This is the Gilbert Manufacturing Company set up during the Civil War. And then when a hurricane came in the 1930s, it washed away the corridor. This corridor we are reassembling. A short section was washed away here and the mill closed down and the, the, the town fell into poverty. And it's coming back out now, believe it or not, and in Massachusetts, we have cannabis. So this mill will be a cannabis production facility on the upper two floors. The lower two floors will be 21st century commercial and retail space. And believe it or not now, the cannabis business in Massachusetts produces more tax revenue to the state and the communities that host this than alcohol does. So welcome to the 21st century. But we'll be having our event here here we have a tour of the mill, walking and biking tours, the electric utility here, which is called National Grid, and they actually own more miles of dead railroad corridor than any other company or, or entity, um, except for the, the transit authority in Boston. And so they are a big player in this and they've green lighted several trail projects. And so we're gonna give them a golden spike award this year. And the corridor back here, it goes right behind the mill. But what's very interesting here in Massachusetts, all communities are required to inventory all their little historic buildings, houses, whatever. And when they inventoried this, it came out to be 133 historic structures here. This is off the charts, unbelievable. It's on the National Register of Historic Places. And we have walking tours of the of the locality and uh, and biking tours of the trail network around. You can see the, uh, the notable places here, they're numbered. Uh, there's actually a covered bridge down here. There's actually an active railroad parallel to the dead railroad here in certain places. And, uh, and so there's actually two railroad stations here, one for the live railroad, it's now a restaurant, it's being repurposed, re we uh, readapted, renovated. It'll be open, I think, for our conference. There's our covered bridge there near the conference site. Now let's look at the trail neighbor abutter lens. Should we call them neighbors or abutters? We'll take a walk down Anti Street here. You know, from my point of view of living near the trail, I call myself a trail neighbor. Abutters, well, those are for people who live next to projects that will produce a 24-hour gas station or some other 
you know, late 20th century, early 21st century, undesirable thing. But a butter is that's a standard jargon in the planning world. And, and, and I just don't like it because it's not true. It, I like to say a butter rhymes with gutter and living next to a trail is not a bad thing. So you ought to call yourself a trail neighbor. But before I forget, there's been a couple of notices of people who were fervently leaders in fighting the trail in their community. Well, here's a couple that trains. When the trail got built, they became fans of the trail. And both of these will be linked on your, uh, your the, the documents that Candace has for you. And the guy on the left there, he's uh, he was a big opponent who then became an avid trail user and he lost a significant amount of weight. The, the guy on the right, the story on the right was in Danvers. Um, it's a 4.3 mile stone dust trail. And by the way, when Massachusetts started building trails here in, uh, in late 90s, that was when the first one started to come here. Massachusetts was the only state that said you had to pave. And so my job early on was to get them to relax that rule. And here's one of the earlier ones built here in Danvers, where there were fervent opponents, including the fellow noted in this report. But he too is now on board with this. And this is my house. When I was taking photos for a rail trail war I was involved in, where the lead opponents were saying they, there was never such a thing as a house with a rail corridor next to it, a rail trail corridor next to it. Now, took a bunch of pictures. This is two years we, uh, before we ended up buying it. And she was the lead anti, by the way, here years ago, the woman who owned our house previously. But um, we bought the house, did a big renovation. Here it is in 2002, the first paint job to be done here. Uh, but we just finished repainting it. They're, they're finishing up today, believe it or not, all these years later. So this is what it looks like today. Uh, the woman, who used to live here, she has donated now to the trail betterments that the local trail group organizes here. And so uh, she saw that as a good thing, but she's not a frontline person easily. So she'll just be in the background, but she came around. The best example I know of in the United States, and I've written three books on this subject, been on several hundred trails, given over 1200 lectures in 21 states. This is it the Ontario Pathways in the Finger Lakes region of New York. Well, this woman, Betsy Russell, did a, 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 she built a group, a land trust, to a linear thinking land trust, let's say, to build the trail out here. And it was a pitched battle. It was not easy. The railroad had sold off significant portions of it uh, before she could organize to buy all the rest. And so they had big, significant gaps. And if you go to that link, norevisionisthistory.org slash OP, you'll see this great essay by her. And it's kind of lengthy, but it's like almost a memoir of the trials and tribulations to get that trail built. And by the way, polite, persistent patience are the three key words that led to her success. They, they didn't have any confrontations, uh, didn't have to get any edgy situations. They just quietly went about their ways, building the trail. And when something became available to purchase later, that's what they did. No ifs, ands, or buts. They just reassembled it where they could, when they could, when it became available. No need to be uh, doing edgy, any edgy things here. This is a dead railroad in Eastern Mass. The second largest landowner in the state is the MBTA. And much of what they own is dead railroads. And they bought them all in four transactions in the early 1970s when we had visionary leaders. And they actually perched, they had no idea why they were buying dead railroads. But now they're being made available to become trails. This is what happens when you convert it, it becomes safe for mothers to walk on. Here's another dead railroad in Eastern Mass. 
Here's another walking club. Here's another dead railroad in Eastern Mass. As you can see, they're all there. The forest is growing up with the rails still in place. Folks opposed to trails will always describe themselves as butters. And we can't afford such a thing. What a waste of money. Bad boys or girls are coming into the neighborhood to do bad things. And we will never be able to sell our house as it will be so devalued. This is Ann Aller, Columbia County, New York, just over the Berkshires, just over the border with the Berkshires here. The county couldn't afford to blow leaves off the trail. So she did it with a leaf blower. And what makes her unique, she's 75, well, she was 75 years old when this picture was taken. She's since passed on. But I met up with her. She usually did it with a broom. But she was out there virtually every day on her rollerblades, cleaning up the trail. Bad boys or girls are coming in to do our neighborhood in. And so when the trail got built, they put up a big fence. Then as time goes by, they see that the trail users are other than neighbors, friends, their kids' friends, their kids, they put a gate in. This happens in lots of places. And um, so gates are usually seen after a few, excuse me, a few years. You'll even see kids on a big tricycle with a saxophone sometimes. And in our neighborhood, that's a view from my office. Uh, we have bears in our neighborhood. Two, two bear families live in our urban neighborhood in the backyards, deep, deep backyards, 400 feet deep. They're all forested. And they even use the crosswalks most times, believe it or not. We're gonna be upside down. We'll never be able to sell our houses or lose so much value. And this is what an upside down house will look like. And I actually, de I actually Googled that phrase. How do you devalue a house? Does a trail devalue your house? And there is a website on this topic, but it doesn't say anything about having a trail nearby that will devalue your house. But if you go to this, you will see that there are some things you can do that will accomplish that task. When I left Rails to Trails in 2004, I became a realtor. That was because all those antis I met over the years, believe me, I know them all, they, uh, they said they would never be able to sell their house. And I said, I'll prove you wrong. And, and so that's my real estate office here, five doors from my house. When I worked for Rails to Trails on a busy month, I would be doing 900 miles a week times four. And today I barely break a hundred miles. Since I'm the first realtor in the United States with this niche, I might as well show the houses I've sold near the trails. This is just one part of the trail network here that I've sold houses near. And believe me, this is uh, the, here. This is the web's best compendium of white paper reports and studies on the subject of Having a trail near your house, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Every study ever written is on this website, including one I did for the MLS around here, multiple listing service. They have MLS, um, MLS is in every state. And in Massachusetts, I did a report for the, to show that the trail was a, a good idea. Bruce Freeman railtrail.org, there's about I want to guess and say over 20 studies on here. Most of them are not new because, you know, this far into the 21st century, do we need reports that shows this? Do, we, do they write reports that show the, the, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west? This is, but every report that has been written is on here. And here's the one I did. I just looked at, this was years ago in 2006. I looked at sales that touted near the trail versus houses that didn't tout near the trail. Very compelling statistics. Houses sold in an average of about 30 days to 50 days. So it's almost half the time. And at a higher proportion of the list price. So you'll see that on the report as well. Here's a house I listed in 2007. It was a 1920 Sears kit built 
bungalow. Sears used to sell houses that you could build yourself. They would be delivered by rail to your local railroad express agency, REA agency, depot. And this was built, was built two houses from the rail trail. Under contract in two days in 2007, just before the Great Recession, sold for about 10% over list. Imagine that. What, what was the cause of that? What, we had multiple offers. Here's the, here's the letter my sellers received way back when. And the seller grew up in Northampton. Now he's got his own little family, came back to town. He's renting for a while. Remember, I remember walking up and down the bike path of your house a million times on my way to school. It would give me great joy to send our children to school down the same bike path my brother and I, brothers and I used on the way. That brought my sellers to tears. That, that wasn't even the highest offer, but that was the best letter. People want to live near these things. They're not, not a bad thing. Here's the first rail trail actually built in, in Massachusetts on the South Coast, which is where Fall River and, uh, and New Bedford are. This is neighboring community to New Bedford on the approaches to Cape Cod. This is actually an old 1840s house. The sidewalk here with the bollard, I bet that bollard's not there anymore, but this was taken in 1999. And uh, this is what it was in the 1840s, sitting right next to the railroads. You know, out in the Midwest or West, the railroads were built first, and then the towns were built. The towns had to be built at 20 mile intervals to feed the steam locomotives. So that's how things got built. And they usually went to extraction industries or just get to the West Coast quickly. Um, in, in the Erie Canal, that there were towns set up along the Erie Canal pathway every six miles, because that's the length of time or distance that the oxen or mules could go. But here in Southern New England, the towns were already built. The, the railroads are built right next to places here. So this is, uh, this is common everywhere. Here's a house in Lexington. You heard of the Lexington and Concord, the shot heard around the world. Yes, you know, beautiful downtown Lexington. Here's an 1880 house I sold about a month and a half ago, 50 steps to the Minuteman bikeway. Imagine that, this too sold quickly. This, a house that sits along the Connecticut River and behind the house is a flood control dike. But when this house is rebuilt, the house is raised 30 inches so they could have a clear view of the river. And the, the Greenway Trail, I don't know, 10 or 15 feet next to the, next to the house. And the, the 100 mile trail I'm building out is two blocks from this. This sold at $1.2 million. This was the highest priced property ever sold in the little community of Hadley up until then. Um, this is another one, recent sale, little, little Cape, two blocks from the trail near my house, actually. This is a 1915 apartment building that was built um, as apartments and there was 10, 35 units here. I've sold 10 condos in here over the last 18 years. This sits right next to the longest interstate trail in, in the Northeast, the North-South Trail I mentioned earlier. This was uh, in Williamsburg, Haydenville Village of Williamsburg. This was uh, a notable house in the effort to get into Williamsburg. And Williamsburg had uh, professional grade antis fighting the trail and they determined who owned it. And then once we figured out who owned it, they just bought the corridor, a portion of it to get it into town. This, um, back up here, excuse me. Got a new mouse and it's a little bit sensitive. The Adams Family Second Empire House is two blocks from the trail. The house with my listing sign there is two doors from the trail. Both the houses on the bottom, actually the one in the bottom on the left is a neighbor of mine. You can see the my house on the right. Uh, that's one house from the trail. And the one on the bottom right is across the street from the trail. More houses near the trail. 
all over. This is in East Bay, Rhode Island, uh, near Providence, East Providence, Rhode Island. This has been in the ground since the early 90s and there's houses after houses near this trail. The houses were built before the trail, the railroad came. There's a triple decker. Most people would take a picture of the image of the ocean to the right. I take pictures of houses near rail trails. And so many kids bike to school in our town that it's worth like two school bus routes. And so very, very innovative around here. MLS pin, I mentioned it earlier. This is the first one that has institutionalized the idea that living near a bikeway is a fine and dandy thing. And I'll talk about a tool I use to reassemble former railroad. This is the back end of the MLS in Massachusetts. And when we go in here, we have hundreds of things to click on or not click on that would be pertinent to the house we're about to put on the real estate market. You see on the upper quadrant here, there's all this thing, public transportation, shopping nearby, a tennis court, a park, walk and jog trails. And then I got a check right here for the bike path. That took me four years to get that on there. This was never on there until I'm with the Murphy's Realtors because David Murphy is on the board of directors of MLS PIN. And I drilled them every month. I need a button on the back end that says bike path, bike way, something. We need to have that on there. So that has institutionalized the idea here that this is something you want to have in your neighborhood. We never put bad things on housing, on the listing sheets. Doesn't say the roof is failing. Doesn't, isn't, there isn't a check off, the boiler is about to blow up. No, only good things are clicked off here. And so another thing I've done here, I've got a very sophisticated specialized search available to me. I've entered into it, the address is about 25 places where the property owners acquired the former railroad corridor behind the property. We don't need to go in and browbeat that person to encourage them to sell the dead railroad behind their house. No, we just wait them out. Eventually everybody sells. When it comes on the market, I will know about it instantly. And we will put together a team to buy the house, carve off the dead railroad on the backside and we'll sell it without it. Like this defunct airport. When part of this corridor went away in the 1930s, when the hurricane severed the line, this is part of the 100 mile trail. Some returning, I think there were returning veterans in the early 50s. They just, they were like pilot advocates or pilot, they, they loved flying. And so they, they bought the right of way of the dead railroad, and created a runway on it, put a little airport there. In fact, if you go to YouTube and you put in Tanner Hiller Airport restaurants, you will see the coolest thing. For tourism, they used to have a restaurant there and people would fly in from all over the Northeast to land there and go to the restaurants and talk airplanes and flight with other pilots. But they passed on the runway it is still a little airport, but it's now on the market. It's overpriced, but I think in the next week, we're gonna be able to put together at least the the outreach to create a team that could buy this with multiple partners. So we'll see, and I'll keep Candace posted as how that goes. And oops. speaking of aerial theme, I didn't mention, I used to market rail freight and I actually operated two of the Northeast largest um, railroad owned transloading facilities. The one on the left is actually over a mile long altogether. And that's what I was doing in the eighties, uh, much younger then. And, and um, but I marketed rail freight for a short line railroad company. And, and we had seven facilities over the years. This was the biggest one. The most notable ones were in uh, Chicopee, Holyoke and Westfield, Massachusetts. This particular one in the lower left was in South Wyndham, Connecticut, and that's the central Vermont, the old ex-central Vermont railroad. And uh, we, um, we were cooking, we, we were, no one ever got killed there. That's right, this is uh, the big thing. No one uh, was ever killed or even injured at any of my facilities. That's the, 
I took tens of thousands of trucks off the roads of that career. Then I was invited to write a series of books about the history of these old bad railroads and their conversions to parks. And so that's how my life changed. But I still take trucks off the road today as a realtor. When I sell uh, houses in neighborhoods that are served by a group called the Pedal People, they come with a bicycle pulling a 300 pound capacity trailer or even a trailer in some denser neighborhoods where people want to do the, the nice eco-friendly sustainable thing. This is, they have tandem trailers here. There's so much business. There are no diesel fume spilling, spewing trucks coming. There's no backup alarms. These are, this is how neighborhoods should be, should be operating. I'm talking about fences. One of the houses I sold was to the pedal people. They live, of course, they live right next to the rail trail. And of course they set in a bike wheel in their fence. How cool is that? Then we have a specialized one-off land acquisition vehicle. This is currently dormant, but I set it up years ago to make a statement that there's a, there's a policy in Massachusetts where you can buy dead railroad corridor. And if it's your intention to block a future trail, well, step right up. The process is largely hidden, but I, since I do a deep dive on stuff, I knew about it. And I watched them watch the sale of a corridor uh, to a guy who wanted to block the future path where kids could walk or bike to school. And so I said, I'm coming in, I'm gonna buy everything else that's available, which was 3.2 miles. And sort of like trust for public land, we're only temporary. We, all, we know how we're getting in when we, we know how we're getting out when we get in. And so this, this was the deal. We were set up as an LLC, not as a 501c3. If I was a 501c3, then the land trust would be the ultimate user, couldn't get funding. So I set it up as an LLC. And I set it up where I would get only my costs and expenses, no markup. Believe me, there's a lot of antis who really do not like me. And they just hate it that I, they can't say I'm in it for the money. No, I'm only in it for the fun. And this is what it's all about. I don't have any kids or grandkids. And so what do I do? I'm not, I'm not yet old enough to golf. And so, I just go and do fun things. I reassembled that railroad corridor. And this is what we did. I go met my new neighbors, get their blowback, feedback, depending on who's who. Some were not pleased, but nonetheless, the trail is built now. They couldn't stop it. What do they not wanna see? They didn't wanna see ATVs. I have to mention that because that's been my experience wherever I build trails. They would like to see non-motorized use. Snowmobiles don't count as motorized. Snowmobiles are part of the, like they're the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. ATVs haven't made that transition yet. However, this is where it was on that long corridor. It's right where our Gilbertville, that's gonna be where our conference is. Ooh, wait till you see this. This is the head of the land trust at the time talking to a reporter. This is one of the three bridges I also bought. Yes, I bought bridges. And believe me, I didn't lose a wink of sleep worrying about people falling off my bridges. And believe me, this is gonna be on your test. Three bridges I bought. Here's another one, bent timber type bridge. Very, very rare. This is a pony truss bridge, last of its type, still standing in Southern New England would have been certainly scrapped out if we let this be bought to the inappropriate person. After the renovation, partial renovation, sorry for the low res photo here, but they redecked it. Uh, there was a local uh, bridge engineer retired. So he did uh, plans and signed off on the engineering needed. And, and so we had that done to 10 cents on the dollar to get that done. And every year they have an annual hike here. East Quabbin Land Trust. Did you ever hear of this on City Lab? 
City Lab is a daily email blast that comes and there's always a story about trails, bikes, cities, how to make your city better. Look at this from 2015, the bright future of the pedestrian bridge. Just a few weeks ago, the governor in Massachusetts, the bridge on the left will be built between two gateway cities. In Massachusetts, we call the places where the old industrial heritage was, the big, the big mills, the places where immigrants came in to, to staff up the mills. Those are called gateway cities. They were the gateway to the United States. And they're being reinvested in now for the first time in generations. And there's actually two other bridges under construction right now on Route 2, which is the northernmost east-west route in Massachusetts. And, and this is astounding. Here's my house before I bought it years ago. Both houses sold in bidding wars. We, we were... Uh, we were 3% over list on this way back when. And one of the reasons we did get to yes with the seller, not because we were a little bit over list, but because we gave her six months to clean it up and get out, of, get out and move out. Um, but we actually uh, been here for, geez, 20, 21 years now. And uh, it seems like yesterday, but we, We've, uh, we've been having the fun time of our lives. We operate a bed and breakfast here. A matter of fact, I have an e-newsletter that goes out to be between uh, 12 and 15,000 people a month. It's free, so don't hold me if it's at five week intervals sometimes when I'm busy. But it, you, should, you should sign up for it because it's all the great stuff going on here. I had battle-hardened veterans in four rail trail wars in Eastern Mass they were going to uh, retire. They were getting beaten down by antis and they just couldn't prevail. And they were getting depressed and disillusioned and they were told me they were gonna quit. I said, no, you just don't know what's going on two miles, two pounds away. I'll set up a news new newsletter. I'll hire an assistant. We will do, uh, we'll do a Google search every day for every story about a rail trail, bikeway, bike path, greenway, everywhere in the region. And we will, we will re-inspire you. There's so much going on that you don't know. I have the full archives for this. Matter of fact, this is my solar array. And that was because I had a near-death experience at the end of 2020 or October, 2020. Um, a 75 foot catalpa tree fell parallel to the driveway. It's at the very left side of the picture here on the grass. And it fell parallel, missed me by a foot. And that was the first time that that house had sunlight on the south side in a hundred years. And now we have completely gotten rid of our electric bill. My wife's getting an electric car this summer and we're looking out for other ways to electrify this. And, and so, We've had the funnest time. I've had people say we were living your we're living your dream life. Featured in Bad's Best of Yankee magazine, believe it or not. Um, words from Calvin Coolidge as I get at the end here. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not. Nothing is more common than unsuccessful people with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. Persistence and determination alone are om omnipotent, omnipotent. The slogan, press on, has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. Calvin Coolidge got his start in politics by negotiating with the city council of Northampton for an additional railroad track 300 yards from my house. They liked his demeanor so much they hired him as the city solicitor. He then, um, he then became the mayor. He then became the state rep, state senator, and then later the governor. 
lieutenant governor, governor, and then vice president and president, believe it or not, all got his start here 300 yards from my house. Polite, persistent patience, remember that. If you have a recalcitrant crowd fighting you, always be polite, always persistent, never have short tempered. This will, you will prevail, you will prevail. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Craig. We've gotten so many questions that came in for you. So I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, let me share my screen again. Uh, and um, well, first question, actually, um, I was trying to find it actually before I had to come back on for the Q&A, but David is asking how to get your newsletter. Oh, you can um, drop me and drop me an email, Craig DP413 at gmail.com. It's put out through constant contact. As I said, it goes out between 12 and 15,000 people. Um, a lot of them are policymakers. I know there's more than a few antis on there. And if you, uh, the interesting thing about it, constant contact has told us about a year after we set it up, it has, um, it's in the top 10% worldwide of all their e-newsletters they produce. That is the most astounding. I'm sort of like Forrest Gump in my life here. I, I've been a, a witness to iconic events all my life. And to see that letter from Constant Contact telling me it's in the top 10% worldwide. Well, that, that, that's memorable. That is memorable. Thank you. That's awesome. I get your newsletter and it's definitely very informative with lots of great information. So um, I will be including uh, Craig's email and my follow-up email as well. So that way, in case you did miss it, you will get it within two days. I'll send that off to everyone. Um, Larry asks a question. I was kind of listening to see if you had mentioned this, but I did not hear it. But Larry had asked a question during registration. Um, do you have any crime rates related to trail development? You know, we need real estate folks to help combat the NIMBY, the not in my backyard messages that the sky will fall if a trail is built near housing. Do you have any the, crime stats that you've seen? Rails to Trails Conservancy has the best that, uh, stats on that. I think there might be even, you have it on your site, Candace, um, about your aspects of trail development. But that was the most recent one I've ever seen. And that, geez, that's, that is over 20 years old, I think. It's, it's, it's another one of those things like there's, there's really not that much crime. If the ab use goes away once you build the trail, there's crime out there on, on unused railroad corridors. That's a given. The crime tends to go away. Um, I would say go to... Where, where is this fellow from, does he say, if you remember, Candace? I would have to look at the attendee list. I'm not exactly sure. Then I would just go, this is the route, the best route you should try. Wherever you are, there will be trails built now. This is not a newfangled idea. There are trails not too far away from you where they have a good long-term experience. Maybe there's not a report, but the police departments in trail towns or, or places that have the trails built the police department welcomes calls from people asking, is this a big problem for you to defend your community against the mayhem on this trail? And they'll say, what mayhem? This is our real life experience. And so go and ask your neighboring police departments what their experience is. In fact, get, do a Zoom call with all of them and have the police department from your community where where they're kind of reticent to move forward with the path. Have a Zoom call with everybody on board and learn the truth. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Jennifer's uh, mentioning they are having trouble working with their local railroad. The track is live and they would like to run a trail beside it. Do you have any examples where this has been done successfully that she can use for convincing them that it can work? Yes. It's only been about 200 places now in the United States. In fact, I was a part mm -hmm. of the team that wrote the first rail with trail. That's its official jargony name, rail with trail, not trail with rail, 
it's rail with trail. You want to give the railroad the upper hand there, make them feel important. And mm -hmm. whenever you go and talk to railroad officials, you can never wear office shoes or dress shoes. You must wear, I should have put this on my test. You must wear <laughs> high top boots. The first thing they're gonna do when they shake your hand coming on the property to see what you're wearing, to see if you get it or if you don't get it. So you wanna be <laughs> seen someone who gets it, you wear your high top boots. Then you'll be one notch above where you started. The, the rail with trail is not a newfangled idea. It works everywhere. The first thing you're gonna do is go to the regional planning agency. Maybe not so much DOT because they're farther removed and less common to have a conversation with someone from the outside world. Go to the regional planning agency or the MPO, depending on what you call it. There will be a transportation planner there. There will be someone who knows the ins and outs of the railroad. Who owns the railroad? Is it a big class one railroad or a little short line railroad? Is it a little short line railroad that's owned by the company that owns a thousand other railroads based in Australia? Is that a good idea for the United States? I'd say not, but that's the reality. It might be part of that company that's based in Australia. You want to know how many trains a day, what the, who the customers are, where the trespassing is taking place. If you have a trail that you think would be good near the railroad, it's probably because you're already using it. So you might need to quantify how many trespassers there are out there because they're not there by welcome. They're not there from any official built out trail. Therefore, they are trespassers. How do you get rid of trespassers? By building the rail with trail in a safe place and make it safe for the train engineers so they don't have to watch them kill, self kill some trespasser. That's what the railroads want. And you have to know too, there's been several states that have, in, that have improved their recreational use statutes to include both railroads and utilities as owners of land that might have a recreational use. And if they opened up that land for recreational purposes, then they would have no liability. Maine and Massachusetts have already done that. There is a bill in the legislature in New Hampshire right now. There are several other states that do this too. Rails to Trails will probably have on their website uh, a list of all those who do that. But since I don't go anywhere beyond 150 miles from here anymore, I don't really know. I don't really care. Mm -hmm. But you might care. So there you go. There's, there's, your, there's your key to get some success going. <laughs> Um, Aaron has a question, um, you know, do you have any examples or guidance on preventing or addressing residential displacement of low income adjacent, adjacent uh, trail communities? They're in the early visioning stages for a trail along a corridor through several low income communities that we hope will use and benefit from the trail, but that's somewhat at odds with increased property values that could lead to the loss of affordable housing along the corridor. So again, um, the question was, do you have any examples or guidance on preventing or addressing residential displacement of low income uh, adjacent trail communities? Okay, um, from my context here, I'm in Western Massachusetts along the Connecticut River. Holyoke, I grew up in Holyoke when it was the wealthiest place in Western New England. And it was a gateway city. And then the wheels fell off when the mills closed down and tightening environmental rules meant that the mills couldn't be readapted. So the wheels fell off of Holyoke and it became poverty stricken. I was involved in getting the Holyoke Canal Walk built. This is a place that hadn't seen a dime really of a public reinvestment in years. The Canal Walk, that was a rail trail in the industrial district where derelict mills were. And Hoyoke with, with, had huge fires years ago. And there was um, large swaths of Hoyoke like Dresden, 1946, after it was firebombed by Allied bombers, completely bombed out. 
and cleaned up in 1946. Hoyoke looks like that. In the last 10 years, though, of the canal walk getting built, there's $250 million of both private and public sector reinvestment. It's not going to be leading to gentrification because the departments that could develop there from the affordable or the old mill complexes, they will be a component, will be some affordable, some, some market rate rentals, some might even be condos. The, the, the poster children for, for, for this stuff is I think the one in, in Atlanta, the, uh, the Beltway Trail, Beltlandia, one of my realtor friends down there has a real estate practice called Beltlandia, um, or the High Line in New York. I was involved with the High Line to get the related companies to relax their idea of to put the pillars for the new neighborhood there uh, in a place, in a way, in a place where the, uh, the, the pillars would negatively impact the railroad coming back. The rail, for a rail bank, you have to allow a way for the railroad to come back. If you do something that prevents that, like put the pillar for this high-end neighborhood um, and prevent the railroad from coming back, that can't be done. And so I convinced them to do it the right way. But both of those are examples of... Uh, <sighs> of pricing on steroids, the, what you don't wanna have happen is have a lot of currently open space to be developed without some thought to the development. If your community, see she didn't tell where it was, did she Candace, I could help me a little bit to know exactly what state it was. Mm -hmm. No, no. Okay. Uh, well, I get. I would have to look at the attendee list, or I can have Kayla look real quick. For yeah, because <laughs> that would yeah. that would be helpful. I'll take but a I would say, I, I would say that the trail, the trail can be developed in a thoughtful way to prevent that um, the the build out from being extremely expensive. If the community is is a worker class place where there was big mills and nearby the little houses and the railroad going by the little houses. And maybe there's a plan to demolish those or build a new neighborhood that would be uh, over, off the charts expensive for the locale. There's a way you can prevent that. You don't need to have that happen. Um, I think thoughtful planning at the front end is the way to go. I, if, if you have a county, see in Massachusetts here, we don't really have counties. So it's each community. And, and, and so several communities who have these dead railroads being converted, they did, they did do thoughtful things. Though the around here though, the land trusts are very prevalent. And, and so there's not a lot of land to develop. And so you're not gonna use, you're not gonna see huge subdivisions. Like I know in the middle Atlantic states, I've had clients who moved here and they came from places that had two or 300 similar houses built. I know that's the case in California too, or in Eastern or San Francisco, it's very uniform build. And, um, but it, if you have thoughtful development, you don't have to do this. You can ensure that developments are small, that the developments will have a, a, um, an affordable, facet to them where you don't have to have them all market rate that you can uh, have affordable complexes or at least portion of the complex overall would be affordable more mixed use which is prim and proper that's neighborhoods of the past neighborhoods of the past those with grid pattern streets sidewalks porches those are the neighborhoods of the future the neighborhoods of the 70s and 80s tend to be cul-de-sac neighborhoods with big lawns and, and um, garages facing the street. And people come home, push the garage door button, they come up and it goes down behind them. They never knew, know their neighbors. It's very unnatural and scary. If they can build the housing next to the trail, 
that is a traditional antique style neighborhood, that would be the way to go. Um, an anonymous, anonymous attendee asked, if you could explain a bit more about how your LLC conservancy is better than a 501c3 for land acquisition. Because if the, if the, if the land trust is going to go and get a grant to buy me out, there's such competition for grants in the state. There's so much land preservation underway around here. They want to know who owns the land. The grant maker wants to know who owns that land that you want to buy. And if you tell them it's a 501c3 set up to protect land, well, why do you need our help to protect the land that's already protected? Setting up as an LLC means I could sell it to whoever I want for whatever purpose I want. And maybe my purpose is some nefarious thing to put up a 24 hour gas station or to just trash out, to scrap out the railroad corridor and scrap out the bridges and sell all the land for people having bitter, bigger, better backyards. No, I wanna sell it to someone who's gonna preserve it, improve it and make it useful for the entire community. That will be a winning combination to get a grant. Does that explain it in 90 seconds or less? <laughs> uh, I hope so. Um, Stephen is asking, have you ever needed to use eminent domain to make a property purchase, perhaps to get the final piece in order to construct a section? Oh, I wish I had. You know, there's been about a dozen places around the state where eminent domain was used. In fact, the first place in the United States to use eminent domain eminent domain was on Cape Cod. There was a dead railroad there abandoned on, it was actually the route of the train to get people to the ferry to go to Martha's Vineyard. The railroad closed it down in 1968 or so. Um, there was a couple of women who lived next to the corridor who wanted to make it a trail. A couple of, a couple of housewives back in the sixties. And they, uh, Took them two years to get the town to look at it. In the meantime, a neighboring doctor who was opposed to the idea of people walking by his house, he bought a section by his house and dared them to, uh, to pry him off. So a couple of years later, the town got sick of asking him to come along to the idea. He refused. The, the town ended up buying everything else from the railroad, and then they had to use eminent domain on him. And he appealed it all the way to the Supreme Judicial Court in Massachusetts. And they said, this is a fine thing. You can use this for this public purpose. So the trail got built, but, it, but the, the really, the really, this is like, I'm like Forrest Gump. I've been a witness to iconic events over the years. And the story of how that trail got built that led to all these other disparate pieces that if you see them all singularly, you won't know what the hell is going on. But if you look at them and all together, well, after the, the SJC decision came down, there were two things that happened. The local state rep proposed two state laws that defend and pr protect railroad corridor and give the state a right of refusal on the sale. There was no role for the state whatsoever. That's my Boston accent, whatsoever to have a role in defending the dead railroad. Well, the other thing was the state transportation secretariat made up of uh, the highway department and the MBTA, the transit authority. They were so shocked and stunned that that eminent domain was now possible. And at that time in the early seventies now, the, the Boston and Maine railroad is collapsing in a bankruptcy. And so the state didn't want things to fall apart. They went in <clears throat> and bought everything inside of Interstate 495, which is a beltway about 30 miles outside of Boston. They bought everything in one felt was four transactions. And some of it was live railroad, some of it was dead railroad. The dead railroad they bought, they had no idea why they bought it. Not a 
bit of one ever instance of they thinking of this for a trail. And so there were hundreds of miles in 70 communities. And if the reason they moved ahead is because the SJC said they could use eminent domain. So they used eminent domain by another name. They call it confirmatory takings. We don't know what the hell we bought. We don't know what the hell the, the quality of title is on these dead piece of junk, derelict post-industrial wasteland railroad corridors. But now we own them in fee and we'll do with them what we want. So some of them actually became live railroad again, a couple of transit places, some places, uh, you know, when I was marketing rail freight, I was taking traffic away from the Boston, the main railroad in Eastern Mass. It was like taking candy from a baby. And, um, but in the end, the, the, the MBTA ended up with ownership of probably over 50 communities of dead railroad. And now they're making them available to the communities for free. And there's no question as to who owns them. That was in the Boston metro area. Outside where I live, it's a different story. Sometimes the title is shaky. Sometimes, and so there has to be an accommodation. Sometimes eminent domain is used. You know, it's um, what I do. I don't get involved that deeply other than to say, I'm there to get places to yes. That's all I do. I don't care if they build asphalt paved, how long it takes them, I don't care. I get them to yes, and I don't look back. And, and that's what I, I resurrect projects that were voted down. There were nine voted down in Massachusetts in the 90s. And uh, so I've resurrected them all. Sometimes there were theft of corridor, of MBTA owned corridor. That's corridor was actually stolen to create a driveway. You're not gonna go to the homeowner and say, oh, too bad you gotta tear your house down. No but you're gonna make sure the MBTA gets punished or gets aware of this. And uh, so I, that's what I do. I, I know what's mm -hmm. going on in the background. I have no, I, no need to help create eminent domain. The community will be the decider. Um, Jim is asking, how do you wait out buying old corridor when the owners are farmers and typically hand down through the family rather than it's sell? What state is that, Candace? What, what state Again, are they? I don't, it just shows their name. So okay. right now. <laughs> All right, well, here we go in the context of land preservation in Massachusetts. Um, there are more land trusts in Massachusetts than anywhere else in the United States, except for California, which is 20 times larger. Well, why is that? How did that happen? Well, that's because here, the first sort of land trust in the United States was the trustees of reservations built in the 18, late 1800s, I forget exactly, but they were there to cajole, to convince, to move along the state to create state parks. And they actually succeeded, but they didn't go away after the state started creating some park lands. They actually then started buying like big Brahmin mansions on the North Shore seacoast near Boston or buying land with interesting geological features like uh, waterfalls or something. Or the Connecticut River near me, there was a portion, a little park that were dinosaur footprints. And it's got a little claim to fame, it's called Wavasaurus because there were, uh, there's an underwater ledge that when the, when the water comes up in the high water time, there's a, 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 a surfing wave there, it's a stationary wave. And so people come from all over. But this land trust, they started teaching other land trusts how to preserve land. And so here we are today. Most of the land trust experience in Massachusetts is not big top-down driven conversations from big national organizations. It is a local organization with a neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor conversation. If you have a land trust that does good work in your locale and your, your, uh, your farmers don't want to make the dead railroad corridor a linear park is the land trust there doing linear work i i break land trusts how to work outside the linear break outside the rectangular land mode and move into the linear thinking land 
there's at least six or seven land trusts now in southern New England and eastern New York, who, in addition to their typical rectangular land purchase preservation, they are reassembling dead railroads. In fact, there's a rail, there's a land trust in Vermont that is reassembling dead railroads through 14 miles, inch by inch. You have to take the long-term view. You have to have a local land trust. Usually the state agencies won't be there to take a lead on this. That's the beauty of the land trusts. They're your local neighbors. They don't have the first sentence saying, I'm from the state government and I'm here to help you. That conversation never takes place. It's always, I'm your neighbor. If you don't have a land trust there, then I would say you need to create one. Create a land trust and don't make it just linear, but make it rectangular land preservation. Go and do good work for the local farmers. There's preservation systems here in Massachusetts where the farmers can sell off the development rights as if they were selling it for housing developments, but they get to keep farming forever. In fact, if you go to foreverfarmland.org, that is a URL that was invented here. I'm on the north side of an east-west mountain range. On the north, the, most mountain ranges in North America go north-south. Not here, it's east-west. So on the north side is all these preserved lands. And the culture is preserve the land for farms. We need the farmers to be local. We don't want to have 1,500 mile wheat. We want to have 10 mile wheat. We want everything local. Foreverfarmland.org. Um, you know, I, I do lectures on this subject all over the United States on these various topics. And I go in and do multi-day lectures and I create change. If you want me to do that, I don't charge. I only do it for fun except you're going to have to buy me way out there if you want me to go out there. So, anyway. <laughs> Well, the answer is a question. Davies from Rochester, New York, asked if you do presentations um, mm -hmm. to individual towns. So that answered his yep. question. Thank you. Um, I was going to mention, too, that Jim, that uh, question I just asked about the farmlands, um, he or farmers, he's um, in Nebraska. So okay. just so you know. Um, Okay, let me see here. All right, a question from uh, Julie. If you were a novice rail trail builder, what would be your very first step to start the trail building process? Would you first go to the local government? Would you hire a consultant? Would you start talking to the adjacent landowners? What would you suggest? I would say, like a lawyer, when a lawyer asks a question, they always know the answer. So you need to become knowledgeable about all aspects of it. And I would say either rails to trails or rails or, uh, or American trails have the, simply the best websites for this stuff, hands down in the country. Then also go to your local planning agency. Your local planning agency will have the capacity to know who owns the corridor, what is going on with it, what kind of quality of title it is. You want to build a friends group that, that has a good spectrum of people. You don't want it to be all spandex clad bicyclists. I remember meetings where 20 spandex clad bicyclists came into a suburban neighborhood in Eastern Mass and said, we're here to help build the trail. And None of the people in the suburban neighborhood could identify that, but there was a website set up the next day, Citizens Against Bike Highways. So you need to have your good friends group to be a spectrum of the community, not just bicycle interests, but broad as best you can. And if you think there's going to be some pushback, maybe because it's, it's a newfangled idea, then I would suggest you look at it as if it was an idea that that was voted down. And that's my favorite thing is to go in 10 years later and resurrect the trail that was voted down. See who's still around opposing the trail. But you bring in speakers around your state or your region 
in places that look like your place, if you're building a trail in a, an old industrial city and you have uh, a spectrum of different kind of neighborhoods, you're going through industrial worker grade housing, maybe more upscale housing, but, but nonetheless, the full spectrum, if that's what your place looks like, then you find places that look like that and have speakers come in and talk about how they built the trail. Or if you have a, it's a more rural place and it's mostly farmland and mostly farms along the way or forests and, and bring in speakers from and done a place, who's done a place like that. You need to have apples to apples and orange to orange comparisons in order to turn lights on over people's heads. You can't go in and bring a, a top-down driven speaker early on. You, maybe a someone who's done the trail in a different locale, but um, top-down driven speakers are better served for a big regional conference, not as your local friends group early on. Uh, if you have land preservation specialists, maybe you have some land trusts nearby, maybe they'd like to learn. Well, many times land trusts don't know this realm. This is very complicated. This is beyond their normal scope of interest, let's say. And so you, sometimes you have to educate the land trusts about what this is. And you know, maybe you can build your own land trust to take control of the corridor. That happened like Ontario Pathways and, and several other places in the Northeast, but you can do this. Um, Rich has a comment and then a question uh, in regards to the Atlanta Beltline of being a repurposed rail corridor circumventing the urban core and it has phenomenal use. It um, is being built in increments and the most heavily used stretch in the northeast portion of the city has seen more development of high cost housing and there is a push to develop more affordable housing along the Beltline. Uh, as well as reintroducing rail for transit. He loves the idea of affordable housing, but he thinks a rail adjacent to a heavily used multi-purpose trail is incompatible and dangerous. Do you have any thoughts? My thoughts about rail with trail is, rail with trail is, is, is the prudent thing to do when you have a lot of trespassers or when you have, um, a dense place and as the belt line grows and gets more popular and populous, it would not surprise me at all to have a transit line adjacent to it. Don't forget the, the passenger railroad experience in the United States is not normal. Amtrak, you know, I'm saying this from my railroad world. In the railroad industry, Amtrak is looked at as a pretend railroad on operating on other people's tracks. If we really wanted to move people the way they used to be moved, even back in the 20s and 30s, those were called trolleys. Interurban lines moved far more people than the heavy rail lines. We wanna have people running on transit lines. Those are light rail lines. Those are proper, you can have those. There's so many transit lines next to where people live, work and play it is not unusual to have that next to a trail. There's many of those. To have um, affordable housing, lots of times the developers, they get into their cookie cutter mode. They know what they know what to build. They know what the price per square foot is in that locale. They know what they need to build it to reach that. And they need to build the houses bigger. They're not gonna build 1,000 foot, 1,200 feet, or 1,400 foot houses when we can build 2,500 foot or 3,000 foot houses. And it's like having the ultimate cherry on top. The bigger houses make bigger bucks for the developers. If you're gonna, if you were smart down there, it would probably be prudent to not have big developers, but to have small developers build five or six houses, five or six houses over here and another developer doing five or six houses build them on grid pattern streets, sidewalks, porches, build the rail trail near them, bisecting communities. You need to have smaller developers to have bigger control because if you're gonna give a control to someone who's big and it's easy to just have one transaction and they're gonna build 75 houses 
well, what if there's a mistake that no one saw? And the mistake gets perpetuated over 75 houses. It's much better to have the mistake get cured on the next batch of five or six and to have, have people living there of different economic stripes and ability to have a more traditional neighborhood, not a stratospheric up in the sky type, type of neighborhood. This is, it's very important to build mixed use, mixed income neighborhoods and building it small. As a matter of fact, a good example here is in Northampton. During the great recession, when we had the condo failures all over the United States and the Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae said, time's up. We're not backstopping any more condos until they, they're half sold. We, you won't even allow to, be, to, to build them until it's half sold. And then you, can, then you can build the complex. And so what does that mean? Well, that meant they're not building 20 unit condos. They're building four unit condos. Two get sold, the thing goes under construction and then it gets completely sold. And then they go around the corner, build another, propose to build another four, sell two, build the whole thing of four. If you're gonna do that in, a, in Beltlandia, build it small, get small builders, give them a leg up in competition with the big monolithic hundred unit developers. That's what you need to do. You need to think like well, in the world of land trusts, this is what happens, think small foreverfarmland.org. <laughs> um, Karen is asking, where can she find the details about your work to buy properties that abut the rail corridor and then resell them after detaching the right of way for the trail? She's dreamed about doing this for some of, their for some of the trails in her area and connections to the trails. I've done that twice and both are remaining a secret because it's not something that we like to tout in the general public, but I'll talk about it in a room full of rail trail fans, but there's <laughs> creative ways to do this. You don't have to think inside the box and kept inside the box. You can do things, get a friendly realtor. Your realtors are your friends, not real estate agents, by the way. There is a real estate agent is a speed bump to get the real estate license. Becoming a realtor is a higher level. And then you see all those acronyms after their names, find one with the CRS, Certified Residential Specialist. Only two to 3% in a given marketplace are those. Those are the top realtors and they do creative things to keep deals from going away. What we do as realtors, the difference between a young inexperienced realtor and a battle hardened one, is how many deals blow up. The experienced realtor will do things that prevent deals from blowing up. The young one won't know. Get a CRS realtor, you can start reassembling corridor too. If you look at the long-term view, you can do that. Have surveyors, your friends, you buy the house, survey it for free or cheap. Give it to a local land trust, the dead railroad to a local land trust, you can do this. <clears throat> we'll do one more question from Brian. Uh, in West Virginia, they have a rail trail owned by the U.S. Forest Service and private logging company. So about seven miles of the trail is split down the middle. Um, and this pertains to the rail trail access and how to solve access issues between two land managers. Wow, that's so complicated. I've never heard of that. I'm glad I'm not there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Well, the basic question I would ask, how much time does the forest company have left to extract all the timber? And then it goes to growing forest again. That would be my main question. What's the timeline on this? I always take the long-term view of things. You know, people tend to sell, residential properties tend to sell on average every eight years. If you have someone who's an extraction industry uh, entity, well, my question would be, how much time do they have left before they extract everything they're mm -hmm. looking for? That would be my question. So. Okay. 
Great. Well, thank you so much, Craig, for all of your time. We only had a couple more questions, actually, we did not get to, but I will work with Craig following the webinar um, to answer those unanswered questions in writing, and then I will share that as a resource with you guys. Um, maybe in my follow-up email I sent you with two, within two days, or I'll send it as a separate resource, and I'll also sure. share it on the webpage um, for this webinar. Um, so thank you again to our web. So this resources slide, I forgot, this resources slide that you see on the screen will be emailed to attendees in my follow-up email. And his name is linked to his email as well if you want to follow up with Craig uh, with some questions. So again, I want to thank not only Craig, but also our additional webinar partners that include the Bureau of Land Management, the U.S. Forest Service, uh, the Federal Highway Administration, as well as the National Park Service. And if you are enjoying our webinars, please consider donating as little as $5 by texting I'm for Trails to 44321. Your donation will go to the Trail Fund, which is a new grant program of American Trails. We had our inaugural application this year, and that deadline has already passed. But we are working hard on funding for 2023 to be able to grant uh, offer more grants for projects next year. And so those for those who immediately donate following this webinar, um, I will select a couple of you to receive uh, one of our Trail Boss mugs as a thank you. And finally, we hope you'll be able to join us for these upcoming webinars. Uh, you can register for them now, and they are all free, including uh, free learning credits. So thank you again, um, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Craig. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day and happy trails.